Okay, let's get started with lecture. So I can't, I'd love to talk about the test, but there are still a couple, a few people who are taking the test on Friday. Um, and for that reason, I can't get the test graded by Friday or post solutions until after class Friday or right around class time Friday because there are some people still taking it. So I will have the test graded by Monday. And I want to make, absolutely make sure that I do a good job in grading because I, of course, for many of you, it'll probably replace test one and I want to make sure it's uh, correctly graded. Any questions before we start? Sorry. Oh, another thing. Um, problem set six is uh, the due date is changed from Friday to Monday. So, and for the other reasons, as we'll uh, see eventually, I may have to move the other two problem sets a little later as well. Because if I put out problem seven on Friday, then I'll I'll only have one lecture to work with to make a whole problem set, and I don't think that's enough. So we'll, we'll see what happens, though. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a prime number, too. It's the only prime number that's less than a... Uh, oh, no, that's not right. Uh, it, 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 there's a special... Rela oh, it's the only prime number less than a perfect... Uh, than a cube of a number. A two-cubed. And there's no other cube which has a prime one less than it. But anyway, uh, any questions otherwise? The room thinned out quite a bit. So any questions on problem set six? We'll, we'll do all the DCFL stuff today. But any other questions? OK, so what were we? finishing talking about on Monday. Well, we did this pumping lemma for uh, context-free languages, right? To show that some languages are not context-free. And so, but before that, we were talking about these models for the context-free languages called the context-free grammars and the PDAs, right? Push down automata. And so, are these two objects non-deterministic? Yeah, because, uh, of course, like in the PDA, you can have a triple epsilon transition uh, going to uh, two different states, right? And so, the PDA will make a non-deterministic choice about which one to actually choose. And so, you may be wondering, well, we talk a lot about in 340, for instance, about context-free grammars to try to recognize or to parse uh, programming languages. Like, we try to make a compiler for C++ or some language like that. And it's not possible to have a grammar be implemented uh, fully because the grammar is non-deterministic, right? It's non-deterministic in what rules to select. Although if you're crazy enough to implement it as a PDA, again, it's non-deterministic. But what you may wonder is, is there a deterministic version of a PDA or a context-free grammar? So we kind of talked about this for regular languages, right? We had DFA is the deterministic version of an NFA. So we have a non-deterministic version of a push-down machine. Well, is there a deterministic version of such a machine? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So a, a deterministic, deterministic PDA. So we're only going to talk about PDAs today, but you can imagine that there's a variant for context-free grammars. So I'm only going to have you learn anything about de uh, deterministic PDAs. And we're going we're to call these DPDAs. So it's exactly like a PDA, but what we would want out of a deterministic one is what? If, yeah, <laughs> I, I hope so, right? But what should change about the PDA? Well, what part about a normal PDA was non-deterministic? About the transitions, right? Like I could choose this transition or this one. So 
everything else about it is going to be exactly the same. States, input alphabet, stack alphabet, everything else is exactly the same. But, um, so has all the same parts as a normal PDA, except uh, the transition function, <coughs> which we're going to define differently. So I'm going to put down the original tra transition function of a PDA, and then we're going to see what part was non-deterministic and how can we make it deterministic. So we, so I'm going to make this in a different color. So this is, so uh, as a thought bubble, I guess. For a normal PDA, we had this delta, which took a state and an input or not, or no input, and a, a stack character to pop or no character to pop. And then we can go to any number of uh, states and things that I can pop combinations. Oops, that's not quite right. There, that's right. So, uh, I, so just as a, a reminder, we have a state input character we could read or not, a uh, thing that we can pop or not, and we can have a, the, that combination go to as many states along with things you can push as you want. So it's just like an NFA where you can go to any number of states, but uh, here we can go to any number of states and things you can push. Well, what is the non-deterministic thing, thing or things in here? The power set, right? Because this says that um, you could have two or more choices you can make, or in fact zero choices you can make. Okay. Well, what else is um, uh, actually, that's it. So that's actually the only thing that's uh, non-deterministic here. Well, let's see. Suppose that we tried this <coughs> instead. So we have the same left side. But we just take away the power set on the, on the um, transition. So, so we have this instead. Okay, well, is this enough? Well, it could be that for this, there could be multiple transitions I could still apply, even though there's exactly one transition for things you can, for state input and stack you can pop. So, uh, as an example, what if we had, let's say we read an A on this one and we didn't <coughs> pop and we didn't push on this transition. But here, um, let's see. And let's suppose that this is not the start state. And then here we have an A and uh, an actual character to pop and let's say nothing to push either. It could be conceivable I could apply both of these transitions. Right? Because if an A is on top of the stack, then uh, the input is no issue with that. But the stack has an issue where I could apply the first transition and I just don't pop anything. And the second one where I actually do pop the character. So that's actually not deterministic quite yet. So what we want is we want this behavior to not be there. Right? right? So if I take any character you can read along with any character you can pop, then there's exactly one transition you can possibly do. So you can't have a duplicate uh, version of a transition because we have these epsilon uh, transitions for when you can pop and push. So what we're going to guarantee is this. Uh, so along with for uh, any state, so we're going to guarantee this for every state. Uh, let's see. So any character that you can read at all. So like an actual character you can read. Not just epsilon, but we'll deal with that. And <coughs> anything that you could actually pop off the stack. So And then we'll deal with epsilon for the stack in a little bit. 
Well, what are the possible transitions according to these? Well, either I could, uh, well, I'm always going to be in state queue. Well, either I could read A or not, or I could pop X or not. So how many combinations in total are there? So I could read and pop, read and no pop, no read, pop, and no read, no pop. How many combinations is that? Four. So we have four situations to deal with. So, so we can have something that corresponds to Q actually reading A and actually popping X, or we could have B and Q not read and actually do the pop, uh, still in Q, uh, actually read but no pop. I said them in a different order, but they're the same four. Um, or I can do neither of them. Right? Those are the four tr uh, possible transitions that I could do if I'm in this particular situation where I'm in this state, I have this thing to read, and this thing is on the stack. So uh, if I just had a normal PDA and I tried to make it deterministic, I could have all four of these type of transitions out and I could apply any one of them. So what are we going to guarantee here in a DPDA? We're going to guarantee that um, exactly one of these four is non-empty. Okay? So, uh, which, so that effectively removes the rule, the two transitions above, because I have both of those possibilities uh, as transitions there. But in a DPDA, I have to have exactly one of the two. Okay? Well, let's see. Does this right here prohibit, if I just pick one of them, say the QAX one, I pick one of them and I say you're the non-empty one, but that transition goes to two different states. Does this right here prohibit that? Well, right here it doesn't, but up here we fixed it because the output of the transition function has exactly one thing. Right? So some member of Q cross then sigma union epsilon. So there, right here, this guarantees that um, exactly uh, one possible transition. And so that's what the, tr the transition function itself guarantees. But the additional restriction says, of all the possibilities that could exist, exactly one of them could ever be taken. Okay? So, you know, we can do an example. But the key here is that there's exactly one transition to do. So, the transition function says there's at most one transition you can do. And down here, it says there's ex exactly one because exactly one of the four is non-empty. You can only apply one of these four. Okay, and there's and from up here, there's only one state you can go to from there. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's actually do an example. Who remembers the zero to the n, one to the n PDA that we made? So, so what was the basic idea on how we made that PDA? Oh, right at the beginning, though. What first? We'll push a special character on to determine whether we're, we have an empty stack or not. Then push on the zeros as we see zeros. Then non-deterministically jump down. And uh, whenever we see a one, pop a zero. And then hopefully at the end, if we uh, pop the dollar sign off, then we try to go to a final state. So let's actually remake this DFA. Uh, not DFA. Uh, PDA. So epsilon epsilon dollar sign zero uh, epsilon zero oops q two which has one zero epsilon uh, epsilon dollar sign epsilon uh, Let's call it Q3 as the final state. Okay. 
is this a DPDA? Well, well, how can you tell? Well, what are the stack characters being used here? Well, it's the um, zero and the dollar sign, right? So let's actually keep track of that. So if we look at, say, Q0, then what do we do? Well, I see an epsilon epsilon here, but the way that you handle these in a DPDA is you fix them to some input symbol. So you think that they correspond to some input symbol even though they don't. So you can think of this as saying, for example, um, uh, zero and we're going to pop a dollar sign, even though we're not actually doing that. So that's one possible combination of uh, things you can read and things you can pop. But what are the other possible combinations? Well, we could read a one and pop a dollar sign. We could read a one and a zero and pop a zero, or we can read a zero and pop a zero. Right? There are other combinations that we could uh, need to worry about. Right? So. Uh, for those combinations, even though we'll never take a transition like that, what should we do with those? If we have an unwanted combination, uh, go to some dead state, right? So if we, uh, just as an example, um, so I'm not going to actually do it for the entire thing, but I claim you can do it for the entire thing. So like, um, so I better not have another transition labeled epsilon epsilon because that means I, I have a non-deterministic transition there. So uh, as an example, one you can do is zero epsilon and it doesn't matter what you push here. But here I'm gonna make a uh, dead state called empty set state. So I can call it Q dead or whatever. And here um, what we're going to say is that um, all possible, or not not possible, all allowed transitions. So any possible allowed transition, I'm just going to stay in that uh, empty set state and then just uh, stay there and I'll never accept. Okay, so the key here is that... Um, we need exactly one of these four to be non-empty. The non-empty one is the, in this case, the Q epsilon epsilon one. But for ev all three other ones, uh, we need to define them to go somewhere in the um, PDA, in the DPDA. So we're going to have them go to an empty set state. Okay. Um, technically, the definition says that you should have this union empty set right here. And the empty set is not actually a state, but you can think of it as a state. Um, because uh, if you have an unwanted combination, which is like the zero epsilon, you're just gonna not accept anyway. So in, in some sense, it is a deterministic machine. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. So Right, uh, where you have the double epsilon on the left side of the arrow, yeah, you can't. You can have at most one of them. Yeah, because if you have two, then uh, that would say that um, the one that's non-empty has two members, and you can't do that. Other questions? Yeah. Be but but here I'm fixing the the input character and I'm fixing the stack character. So if I'm if the character A really is the one, next character to be read and X is really the top of the stack, then any one of those four I could execute. All four of them are possible transitions. Re remember, I don't have to read and I don't have to pop. So all all four of these are possible which is why we say exactly one of them we're going to force to be possible. It can't be that 
none of them are possible, and it can't be that two or more are possible, because that would introduce non-determinism. Okay? Other questions? So if you do this type of uh, going to this empty set state for every <coughs> unwanted combination here, then what we just introduced is that this PDA now has become a deterministic PDA because we just introduced all the unwanted combinations. They go to this empty set state and you'll never accept anyway. So in fact, um, the, uh, that will be a DPDA. So we'll say that a language, as you might expect, is a, a DCFL, so a deterministic context-free language, if it is recognized by a DPDA. Yeah? Why didn't you need a transition to the empty set state? Be because I need to have um, all the possible other combinations other than, say, this is the one that we considered. All the other ones need to be defined to go to empty set because I can have exactly one combination for every input character and stack character. There can only be at most one transition. So I need to define it to go somewhere and so we're defining it to go to a state that is empty. And you just happen to choose the zero epsilon dollar? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's kind of confusing, I admit where you have an epsilon epsilon, but that we're going to imagine corresponds to some character and stack character, even though we're not actually reading and we're not actually popping. So we're going to fix it to say, for example, um, the read is zero and the pop is dollar sign. But we're not, it's not actually going to do that. So then we're going to say all the other combinations that you could apply there go to empty set. Can you explain why an epsilon epsilon to dollar is apparently the same as epsilon epsilon to hash? Uh, great question. So why, are, so I'll just put it down here. So if we have a transition like this, so why is this effectively the same transition as this, as in your example? Yeah. Uh, it's just a character, but that doesn't imply that they're the same transition or not. Well, look at the transition function itself. It says that if you know the state, the thing that you're going to read, and the thing that you're going to pop, then you, then after that, you know what state and what thing you're going to push. So the, the things that determine whether or not you can apply the transition at all are what you can read and what you can pop. The thing you push is just a after the transition effect. It, it has nothing to do whether you can apply the transition, which makes sense because there shouldn't be any restriction as to what you can push on the stack, but there is on what you can pop. Yeah. So, so should we change the definition of the DPDA to include the subset? Uh, we did. Yeah. So, so I, I put it here. So, so, so I kind of said it earlier, um, this is just a visual representation. It's not like we're, there's an actual state called empty set that you go to, but it's just saying um, we're, in effect, we're going to a state that looks like this. We're not actually doing this. So um, uh, just an artist's conception right here. So it's not actually going to a state. So I still have the same four states I had before, but in the formal definition of the DPDA, we're going to define them to go to empty set. Whereas with the normal PDA, the not deterministic one, we just didn't define them at all. Right? But here we're defining them to go to empty set directly. Okay? But but it's it's in effect the same thing as going to a state that doesn't accept. Other question? Yeah. Correct, yeah, yeah. But uh, what you can't show is two transitions that you can apply simultaneously. Yeah. So DPDAs are actually kind of nice to draw compared to DFAs. Other questions? Yeah. Um, 
would we have to draw multiple transitions to the dead state? Like from well, as I said, there's uh, you're not actually going to cons like uh, draw a picture of a empty set state and go there because obviously that would be too many transitions. And the DP and but more importantly, the DPDA is not actually going to this state. It's it's just an artist's conception of what actually would happen, but it's not actually doing this. Yeah. No, PDA when we have unmarked transition, those effectively are doing the same thing. That we're yeah, but we're going to explicitly say empty set in this case. Okay. You're, you're technically right, but it's just to make it more uh, concrete here. But but you are right for that case. Other questions. Okay, so it, suppose that we uh, did this um, construction where we uh, looked at this PDA and then we defined all these other transitions to be defined to be empty set. So what can I say about zero to the n, one to the n? Well, uh, let's look at this for a second. Is this actually a DPDA if I actually do this? Do I have two transitions I can apply simultaneously? Well, think. Well, the only ones that could uh, be an issue are these two, right? Because the last two have different stack characters, so they cannot uh, be in conflict. So the only ones that could be in conflict are these two, right? But remember that double epsilon or epsilon and either one, you can think of as being applied to a specific character, even though we're not actually reading. So I say, well. Uh, think of this epsilon as a one, and and that fixes it. Okay, so but it's not actually reading a one here. Okay, so for every combination, well, um, think about it. If you have a zero on the input, there's exactly one transition you can do, and if you have a one on the input, well, we define that to be the epsilon epsilon one to be the non-empty one. Okay, so there's exactly one transition I can apply for any combination of input <coughs> or things I can pop. Okay? Yeah. Like, I mean, are you saying we have to change that to a one? Cause... No, no, we're not changing it to a one. It's, we're assigning it in our minds to be the combination that corresponds to one epsilon, one or a specific character. We're defining that to be this transition in that one case. Q1 has a transition to the zero epsilon and an epsilon epsilon. Right. Seems to violate the, it's, you've got two well, we'll consider the we'll consider the two combinations. Um, so you can have a zero on the input and a zero on the stack. Zero on the input, dollar sign on the stack. You can have one on the input, zero, one dollar sign. Right. Those are the four possible combinations because there are two characters in the input and two characters on the stack alphabet. Correct. There are four combinations. So we're going to say, well, if we look at this 0, 0, we need to assign one of the four possibilities to be non-empty, right? Because that's the definition of the transition. So I'm going to say, well, I'm going to define this to be uh, the third case right here. So I'm going to say that, that that set is non-empty for that combination. Okay. Okay. But I'm just looking at every combination and assigning it one of the four possibilities. And that's all I'm doing. Yeah. So you're looking at the first uh, two on the left hand side and you're not considering the zero on the top or the epsilon on the bottom? Yeah. But remember, it's the things I read and pop that matter whether I can do the transition. The push has nothing to do with it. Yeah. So in a regular DFA, you've got to have a transition out of each state for yeah. each character in the alphabet. Mm -hmm. Is that analogous to what's happening? Here? It is, but we have this weird <coughs> situation with epsilons. But the, the main idea is we have exactly one transition to apply at any given point. Not all of the transitions. We need to have all of them. We have exactly one, yes. Yeah, so there's exactly one transition you can do at any point. Yeah. Because I can apply any one of these four possible transitions. So I, and 
we want this to be deterministic, so we need to set one of them to be the non-empty one. So why did you choose I, I could, actually. But the issue with that, I actually could in this case. Yeah. So, so as long as I set them in the way so that the machine still remains deterministic, then at any point I can figure out which transition to apply. It, it may need some work and to say, okay, the epsilon epsilon one is the only one I could apply, but I, I can actually figure out which one that is just by looking at the other transitions and yeah. Not for that combination. Because, um, so, so I, I can go over this in office hours, but the point is that um, this doesn't necessarily correspond to zero epsilon, even though I could apply this, right? So I'm going to assign it to be, say, for example, zero dollar sign, as, as an example. But, I, but I'm not actually carrying out the read and the pop here. Yeah. It, it depends on, it, so there are multiple ways you can implement this. So s some of these you can make the epsilon epsilon one, some you, you can set to be not, so there's, it's not uniquely made. So one, exactly one of them is not empty, that's the entire point. Other questions? Yeah. I'm still having we were trying to trace the execution of this machine, mm -hmm. and we get an input. So you chose that bottom epsilon, or the middle epsilon, yeah. to be a one. What mm -hmm. happens if we find a different character? Well, well, there's no other character in the input alphabet because we define it to be zero, one. And so there's no other thing that we could see. So. I can do a, a trace through computation in office hours if you like. Yeah. So, but this shouldn't be the hard part. If you have one read epsilon, pop epsilon transition out of the state, and that's it, would that be enough? Could you use that for every? Well, it depends on what the what the input and alpha and uh, stack alphabet are because you need to handle every combination of one and the other. Um, it and it depends on which ones you define to go to empty, and which ones are defined possibly to go elsewhere. But if there's exactly one combination that goes out, well, one transition for each combination, then you're all set. That's all you need. So you can use that fourth option for everything, just like arbitrary. No, like no, because um, because. This can only, the fourth option can only correspond to one pair. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. So, uh, so this is a, so a language is a DCFL if it's recognized by a DPDA. I claim that zero to the n, one to the n for this reason is a DCFL. Because uh, I claim that uh, through uh, some analysis of the above PDA, we can turn it into a DPDA. Okay, but you may wonder, well, uh, so I don't have a ton of time here, but I'll, I'll just sketch it because it's the stuff at the end, but um, you may wonder, well, are DCFLs and CFLs the same? Because we talked about the language is recognized by DFAs and those by NFAs, and we showed via the subset construction, which you did on the test, uh, that they are in fact the same languages, right? I can convert any NFA into a DFA. So clearly, CFLs contain the DCFLs, right? Because DCFLs are just a special case of a PDA. But are they in fact the same? But what we'll actually show is that DSCFLs are not equal to the CFLs, pretty surprisingly. So, and the way that we'll show this, so I'm only going to sketch this, is that DCFLs are closed under complement. 
which will immediately show that they're not the same because we showed already that CFLs are not closed under confluent. So if I show this, then they're definitely not the same. So how would we actually show that the, these set of languages are closed under complement? Well, how did we do it for DFAs? Well, we just flipped what was the final state and what was not the final state. What if we just did the same idea for a DPDA? The issue is, well, the unlike NFAs, thankfully, we don't have the situation where um, I have a situation like this where, where I have two computations that lead, one goes to an accept state, one doesn't. And if I just flip what is final and what is not final, then I'll still accept the string if I, even if I complement the machine. So we avoid this issue because it's a deterministic machine now. So that's, that's fine. But the issue here is if I flip what is final and not final, I might not accept the... Uh, the string because I might not read the whole string. How would I fail to read the whole string even though I have a transition I can apply at every point? But there's always a transition to, to find for any pair. The issue is what if I pop an empty stack? Uh, there's nothing that's, that prevents me from popping an empty stack, right? So how do we fix that issue? So first off, we want to make sure that the DPDA reads the entire string, okay? Because if I'm going to be flipping the states, I want it in this other computation possibly to read the entire string because I want it to accept in the non-final state. Uh, it, so if the original machine took it to a non-final state, um, a particular string, then and it didn't read the whole input, then I might have an issue if I flip what is final and not final. So I want to guarantee the machine reads the entire input. Okay, so how do I do that? So, so how do we modify a DPDA to always <coughs> read the entire input? So I'm only going to sketch this. So how would we do this? Well, what we could do is say, like the PDA that we just talked about, we can push on a special character at the beginning, and then at any point, we're, we're, at, that, we're at some random state, and we say, oh, uh, we see this special character on top. What should we do? Well, if we see this special character on top, I'm trying to pop an empty stack at this point, which means I should go to the empty set state or define it to go to empty set. So uh, if this is the DPDA, we are going to put on a dollar sign and we're going to insist that dollar sign not be used elsewhere in the DPDA, uh, originally the DPDA. And then for any, uh, any state over here, if we see a dollar sign on top of the stack, that means we're and we're going to try to pop, we define it to go to empty set. So uh, define uh, this to go to empty set if attempt to pop stack with dollar sign on top. Which makes sense, right? So we're trying to avoid the situation where we pop a stack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, the empty set is not a final state. Sorry, not a final state. Yeah. Like, well, without doing this. Well, um, it's just I can't guarantee the input will be entirely read. Okay. Be because I may pop an empty stack. Uh, I can't guarantee that. So here we're guaranteeing that because. If we try to do a bad thing, pop an empty set, we're just going to say, yeah, we're going to finish in this empty set state just by reading the entire rest of the input. And then if we succeed otherwise, that means we've read the entire input. So that must mean that 
this construction tells us the DPDA reads the entire input. Uh, all of its input. Well, we, we avoid that issue because there's exactly one transition to apply at every point. In a normal PDA, yes, I would have that issue. But in a DPDA, I don't. Yes. So the issue is not that we have two outgoing transitions. The issue here is, well, suppose we're doing a computation and we're, we end in a final state, for example, and then we have some epsilon whatever whatever transition go to a non-final state, right? So that could happen. I'm allowed to have that type of transition here. Well, if I flip the final and non-final states, then do I still accept the same string? Well, if I ended in a final state before, could I still end in a final state if I flip the final and non-final states? Yeah. So the idea here is to so uh, just entirely as a sketch, um, separate uh, no, uh, what are called reading and non-reading states. And what we would have to guarantee is that um, if we read something while we're still in a final state, uh, sorry, um, sorry, if we do an epsilon transition when we're in a final state, we better still be in a final state. We can't go out to some non-final state because if I flip, then uh, we'll have this issue. So I can sketch that. Actually, I have plenty of time. Three minutes. <laughs> All right. So how do we actually do this? So, well, what could be the issue? So what we're going to do is we're going to make a copy of every state. So if we have a state like this, so let's see. So if we have a state like this, and, um, okay, but before we do that, what is a reading state? So a reading uh, state is one that has... Uh, delta of Q, A, empty, not empty. So this means that I'm not popping the stack because um, uh, we want this to be that we're just entirely reading and not changing the stack. Okay, well, let's see. What does that even look like? Well, if I have a transition from Q on uh, A, epsilon, and it doesn't matter what we push here, to some state Q prime. Well, how do I fix this so that um, what we want is that let's see, what, what, is, the, what is the thing that we want here? We want to have a state in the middle called Q sub x <laughs> to indicate that Q is a reading state in this situation. And what we want is that we want to do the, um, okay, actually we do need to give a name to the thing that we uh, pop in this case. So if we actually do a pop and we actually, um, uh, it doesn't matter what we push, then we are going to separate the transitions. So here we're going to do e uh, epsilon instead of reading here and do the pop first and then afterward we're going to do the actual read and not pop. And so here the issue may be that we could have this situation where we're in some state and we have some symbol on top of the stack and then at some point later if we just run the machine longer then we'll come back to the same state and we have the exact same st uh, stack contents right there. And so what we're going to do next time is we're going to finish up this construction and show that we could avoid that type of situation and fix them. Any last questions? All right, I'll see you on Friday. <laughs>